Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Wally, for such uh, wonderful music. And um, I thank the Lord that this is the Lord's Day and that we can gather together and honor him today. What unusual times we're in. Um, and um, it looks like we won't be... Um, it won't be too long until we can meet inside. We are going to uh, discuss what needs to be done, and um, as soon as possible, we will reopen the sanctuary to to uh, Sunday morning worship. I want to welcome each one here today, and I want to welcome each one that listens or watches on YouTube. You never know. You never know who might be tuning in to this Sunday worship service. Uh, if there are any announcements, if there are any uh, newsworthy items, please contact uh, one of the uh, elders or the church office and, and we'll make sure to, to handle the announcement appropriately. Um, we certainly are in difficult times. Good morning, Roger. You know, part of Old Testament Sabbath observance was that no one was allowed to carry any burdens on the Sabbath day. We know from Scripture that sometimes people were guilty of that and they were severely disciplined. Well, we're not under that same rule, certainly, but I think there's something we can gain. We're not supposed to carry burdens on the Sabbath day. And so if whatever's going on in your life, whatever's burdening you down, whatever difficulty that you are in or you know others are in, let's lay it down today and not carry it with us on the Sabbath day. This is the day that God has created for us to worship and enjoy together. You know, I think it's the easiest thing in the world to worry and to fret and to find fault with others and to be critical. That all comes very natural to us, doesn't it? But God wants us to commit things to him and not let worry overwhelm us and not let fear invade our hearts. So let's worship the Lord together this morning. If there are any prayer requests, please make them known and we'll certainly pray this is a time where we should be praying more than ever. There's a little plaque that we have, a little magnetic plaque on the refrigerator at my house that says, when it's hardest to pray, you should pray hardest. When it's hardest to pray, you should pray hardest. So let's not give up, but let's continue in prayer and in faith this morning. If you... Um, need a bulletin, um, please contact the church office. We'll make sure to, to get one to your email box or to your physical post office box, um, and we'll follow along together. The call to worship as found in your bulletin. The psalmist wrote, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of his pasture." in the sheep of his hand. Beloved, it is right, it is proper for us to bow down and worship the Lord God today. We were created for this. We are designed for this very purpose. For us to worship the true and living God is a fulfillment of God's plan for our lives. And so let us not be lukewarm nor half-hearted in our service today. It is a great privilege for us to be gathered here today and to offer praises to the creator of heaven and earth and to honor our dear Savior Jesus the Christ this morning. Amen. The first hymn is number 43, Grant us thy faithfulness. And if you all want to stand, no, just kidding. You can all be seated in your cars, number 43, all verses.
pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear hand to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings are mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. It's certainly one of the great hymns of the faith. Great is thy faithfulness. That's taken from the book of Lamentations. Lamentations in the Bible was written by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And much of his prophecy, much of his ministry, was the dire conditions of that day. The rebellion of the people and the... And the um, the terrible conditions in the land. But in the middle of that, there's these wonderful verses. I think it's chapter 3, where Jeremiah writes, Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see, that in spite of difficulties, in spite of troubles, in spite of things going on outside of us and things going on inside of us, we can declare, we can declare God's faithfulness. Well, Wally, let's sing that chorus one more time, could we? Great is thy faithfulness. The chorus again. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you, Wally. Thank you. Let's turn in our bulletins to the prayer of confession of sin. And let's read it together. Oh, Lord, who do we think we are kidding? There is nothing hidden from your sight. There is nothing, nothing spoken that you do not hear. You know who we are and who we are not. And you said that there is a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Oh, how sobering that is. We think we know so much. We think we're so smart. We think we are so great, and yet you say, that we are in danger of destruction. We need your help, Lord. We turn to you for your mercy and your guidance this morning. Forgive us our sins. Heal us of our miserable backsliding. Restore our hearts to thyself. Make us the men and the women that you want us to be. Lord, let the Holy Spirit invade every portion of our heart. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. And some select verses from Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, in the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. 
The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Our soul waiteth for the Lord, for he is our help in our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. And Jesus was asked what the greatest of all the commandments are. And he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And there's a second commandment just like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That is the challenge for each of us today, isn't it? To love God and to love each other. How thankful we ought to be that here we are today, this first Sunday in June, another opportunity to strive to be more like Jesus. On those two commandments hang all the law in the prophets. Amen. come to a time of prayer. I hope that we take time in our lives, in our days. I was going to say in our busy lives, in our busy days, but you know things are a little different these days and many of us have more time than ever. I hope that we take time during our days to pray. The Bible is clear that God hears the prayers of his children. And the Bible is clear that he wants us to pray. That's how he accomplishes things. It's a great mystery, isn't it? But that's how he accomplishes things, through the prayers of his people. We live in troubled times, don't we? who had any idea what was coming when we entered this year of 2020. You know, people are so quick to judge, so quick to criticize, so quick to get angry. I'm not going to say much about what's happening in many cities around the world, many places where people are protesting, but my wife, Patty, put this on Facebook the other day, and I thought it was good, and I'll read it. It's just a short sentence, really. What if all Americans were as dedicated to gather for prayer as some are to protest and riot? I like that. And I would bring it home a little more. What if all Christians were as dedicated to pray for our leaders and our government officials as some are to criticize and speak evil of them? That's a challenge, isn't it? We are called to pray. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for this Lord's day. We thank you for the promise of your presence 
in our lives as we look to you. We thank you for this truth, even though we don't really understand it all, that you, you encourage us and you want us to pray. And somehow you, you take those prayers and you use them for the glory of your kingdom. So Lord, help us to pray. Help us to be slow to speak evil. Help us instead to be quick to pray and to forgive and to let you work things out. Lord, we pray for our loved ones. We pray for our families. We pray for children and grandchildren. And we pray your blessing upon each one, wherever they are, whatever they're doing this morning. We pray, O oh God, for those who are sick or recovering from sickness. We pray for those who are hospitalized. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. Lord, you are the great healer of our bodies. You are the great healer of our souls. Work, O oh God, according to your purpose today, we pray. It says in the Bible that you healed all that came to you. Help us to come to you. Help us to receive healing today. Lord, we pray for this community and for the many communities in our land that you would grant us peace, that you would grant us wisdom, that you would show us the way to go and help us to honor you in all that we do and all that we say. Lord, we pray for our president, we pray for our governor, we pray for our local officials, we pray for all those that are in places of authority. Lord, we need your help so much. Help us to pray faithfully for those who are making decisions that affect us all. Lord, we pray you take away disease, take away this virus. Lord, we look to you, Lord, for your help in our land. We want to meet together on the inside. We want things to go back to some kind of normal. Help us, oh God. Give us the strength and the courage and the perseverance that we need in these days. Oh Lord, we pray God bless America. God bless our country. God bless us as we walk together in these difficult times. And thank you for the prayer that you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And as found in your bulletin, let's recite the Apostles' Creed together. As I have said before, here is a summary of our Christian faith. Here are these values that we hold jointly as a congregation. It's something we can declare and encourage each other as we recite this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body in the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We have a musical meditation by Wally Jones. Thank you, Wally. What a beautiful song that is. Sometimes, hallelujah. I would like to read from Luke chapter 23 this morning. It is a portion of the account we have in Luke of the crucifixion of our Lord. And I'll begin with verse 26. And Pilate has passed a judgment. Pilate has washed his hands, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. And the crowd said, his blood be upon us. And Pilate has released this murderer, this man 
that was awaiting trial for sedition named Barabbas, he releases Barabbas and sends Jesus to be crucified. Verse 26, And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the countryside. And on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people, of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren in the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, that is, when everything is going well, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two others, malefactors, two thieves, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment, and they cast lots for it. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided Christ and said, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the thieves, one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, the other thief answered, rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And the thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God and said, Certainly, this was a righteous man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, we just thank you for the word of God. You said it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It gets inside of us. It cuts away at us. It does its work in us. Just the word of God. And so we thank you for that word. And pray that it might accomplish all that you have in store for us today. Lord, let the words of my mouth the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Help us to hear what you want us to hear. Lay aside what you want us to lay aside. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, if you remember, 
I recognize some of the cars, so you were here last week. Last week, we talked about Pentecost Sunday. We read from Acts chapter 2 and talked about this wonderful event as recorded in Acts chapter 2, the invasion of the Holy Spirit into our fallen world. First at Jerusalem, and then the surrounding areas of Judea and Samaria, and then to different cities in the Mediterranean world, and finally, at long last, to the uttermost parts of the earth, even Clarksville, USA. And I said last week, and I still believe it this week, that the greatest need in the church today is for men and women to be filled with that same Holy Spirit. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, and he said, keep on being filled continuously. Because the Holy Spirit is to be the power generator in our lives, the power generator, generator in our church. You see, church is supposed to be a, a recharging station. Church is supposed to be a filling station. And that's my prayer. That each of us would be more filled with the Holy Spirit every time we meet together. Well, that was last week. And today my sermon is entitled, The Greatest Need in the Church Today, Part 2. How about that? You had part one last week, and now you have part two. Can I ask a question? Is there going to be a part three? Well, you'll have to come back and see next week. But today, part two. And let me do it this way. I've got good news and I've got bad news. Let me give you the good news first. The good news is that God is with us. That the Holy Spirit has been unleashed upon humanity. And He, in the power of the Holy Spirit, is available to all believers. The Holy Spirit is our helper, our comforter. He empowers us for service. And he leads us and guides us into the will of God for our lives. That's the good news. That he's alive and he's with us. The bad news, or could I say the uncomfortable news, is that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. And we as followers of Christ are called to walk in holiness and in the way of the Lord. 24-7, 365 or 366 days a year. In sunshine and in rain, in cold and in heat, when things are good and things are bad, in time of peace and in time of trouble, we are called to reflect the image of Christ in all that we do. That's why Christ said this to his disciples. He said, I am the light of the world. But he also said, you are the light of the world. You, you and I are the light of the world. Let your light, your good works, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. It's, it's very clear in Scripture we are to reflect Christ to the world. Our lives, your life, might be the only Bible that many people will ever read. Our lives are to reflect Christ. And it isn't just our talk, it's our walk. Let me make sure we understand the situation that we're in. As a congregation in the Reformed tradition, we hold fast to the doctrine that we are saved by faith, not by our good works. 
We can't make ourselves good enough to be accepted by God. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, not by our good works. We are brought into fellowship with God by the mercy of God, not by our good works. Christ is my salvation, not my good works. But that does not mean that my behavior, my way of life is unimportant to God. It does not mean that the way you live does not have any consequences. Paul decries the state of certain men in the early church that there was no fear of God in their eyes. And the book of Jude warns us about certain men who have crept into the churches and have perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ and have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, into loose living. They said something like this, well, God is a God of grace and because of his tremendous unwavering love, we can do whatever we want. God will forgive us. Let me clarify. God's grace offers forgiveness, but it is not a license for loose living. It is not a license to sin. My God is a holy God. And we are called to honor him by our lives and to fear him. Did you, re did you hear what I read from, the, from Luke 23? Where was the fear of God? Where was the fear of God in that, that day long ago on a hill called Mount Calvary? The religious leaders stood nearby and they sneered at Christ mocking him, laughing at his messiahship. The Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothing and jeered and mocked that king of the Jews. And one of the thieves hanging right next to Jesus cursed him and reviled him. And we read the other thief said to his companion, don't you fear God? Is there no fear of God in you? What are you thinking? Here we are condemned to die, and do you really want to spend your last minutes, your remaining strength, in cursing and abusing this innocent man? What are you thinking? Don't you understand that we are dying? and we will stand before God after this death? And I must say the same thing to us here in the year 2020. Do we fail to understand that very same thing? Don't we really grasp that our lives are just a vapor, a brief puff of smoke, and that very soon each of us and every one of us will have to give an account of our days and our nights before God? What are we thinking? Where is the fear of God in our society today? Do we understand as we should that my words and my actions have eternal meaning and importance? The greatest need in the church today is a work of the Holy Spirit. A work of the Holy Spirit. A renewed fear and a respect for God. A consciousness that God is our benevolent creator and our righteous judge. Do, do we really think that God's standards somehow don't apply to our lives? That sexual immorality can be winked at now? That drunkenness is okay with God? That filthy talk and cursing is okay because everybody else is doing it? That gossiping and backbiting and rumor mongering is somehow acceptable to God? That stealing and lying are no longer sinful? So where's the fear of God today? We are children of God. 
We are part of God's family. But that does not mean, let me say it again, that does not mean that we can do as we please and we can flap our lips just as loudly and obnoxiously as we want to. That does not mean that we can post stuff on Facebook that we would be ashamed to say in public. We are children of God. We must act like children of God. We must represent Christ to a sick and a sinful world. You might think, well, you can do and you can say as you please, but there are consequences to that. We are capable of grieving the Holy Spirit. We are capable of marring the work of God is doing in our souls. And most evidently, we are capable of hurting other people causing other people to stumble and fall. I remember well when Martin Luther King was assassinated. April of 1968. And riots broke out across America that have only been revisited in these recent days. I was 17 years old at the time, and I was a junior, I guess, in, in high school near Utica, New York. And a classmate of mine were, was talking about the events, the riots, and on a whim, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Utica newspaper. There was no Facebook back then. I wrote a letter to the editor that was very critical of Martin Luther King and all the attention that his death was getting. Well, the newspaper printed it. And it brought a flood of angry responses. Not directed to me, directed to the community I lived in. Now, my parents were respected members of that community. They were well thought of by all. And I remember my mother approaching me, visibly upset, and saying to me, David, what were you thinking? By my brashness and my thoughtless behavior, I had brought shame to my family. Shame to the entire community. We can bring shame or we can bring honor to our family by our behavior. We can bring shame or we can bring honor to the name of Christ. We can bring shame or we can bring honor to God by the words that we speak and by the actions that we take. Do we really want to end our lives and stand before God with nothing to show but shame and regret? God in his great mercy has showered you and I with great gifts. All that we need to live a life of honor, a life of godliness. He has given us the gift of his son so that we might be forgiven of our sins. He has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that he can be our helper and our teacher. He has given us the written Bible as our guidebook and a source of inspiration. And he has given us the church as a refuge, a recharging station, a place for teaching, for healing, and for fellowship. These are not little things. These gifts of God are monumental, essential. They are life-giving. Peter ends the first part of his famous sermon in Acts chapter 2 with this promise, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what, you might ask? Saved from yourself. Saved from your selfishness and bitterness. Saved from our sin. Saved from the muck and the mire that clings to our lives. Saved from the shame of the past. 
in the fear of the future. Let's call upon the name of the Lord today. Let's recognize that the Holy Spirit is for us, not against us. And we can live uprightly and godly before Him, walking in the fear of God. Let's call upon the name of the Lord. Let's avail ourselves of this time and this opportunity that we have here on earth so that we can be lights in this dark and fallen world. So that we can be candles that will not be blown out by the wind. So that we can burn bright and clean for Jesus Christ today. This is the day that the Lord has made. And this is the perfect day. This is the perfect time for you and I to shine for him. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us to shine for you today. Help us to lay aside things that we know we shouldn't be doing. Help us to zip our lips when we're saying something we know we shouldn't say. Put within us, my God, a fear of you, a respect for you, an awe of you, a love for you that we truly don't want to sin against you. Lord, I look to you for the work of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. As before, we will not take up an offering, but please send your gifts and offerings into the church. Box F, Clarksville, New York. They will be much appreciated. Our final hymn is number 190, All the Verses, Are You Washed in the Blood? Blood of the Lamb, are your garments 
spotless are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Thanks always to Wally for the wonderful music, for uh, David Moat for being so faithful in setting uh, this platform up and for videoing. Uh, thanks to all who are involved. We are, we have to work together. We are and we need to be a team working together for the cause of Christ. Uh, dear Lord, we just thank you for all that you're doing in our hearts and our lives. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is working in us, drawing us closer to yourself, wooing us away from the world and towards the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, I just pray you'd be with each one of us as we uh, depart. Lord, protect us. Help us to stay safe. Help us to be mindful of how we should walk and how we should talk in the things that we should say. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for staying with us and not giving up. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who died, who rose again, and who is soon coming again. Amen. Amen. God bless each one of you.